And with that, I will hand things over to Sophie. Hi everyone. Before we really get started, I just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. So the Rensselaer Plateau sits within the ancestral and traditional homeland and territory of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohicans. And they stewarded this land before they were forced to move west to Wisconsin by European settlers. And some Mohican people remained in New York and some have returned home from Wisconsin. RPA, as you know, now cares for this land today with deep respect and gratitude. Um, but we seek to build lasting partnerships with and to amplify the needs and perspectives of local indigenous communities. So that's why we are doing the land acknowledgement today and we'll continue to do so. Um, yeah, and with that, I'd like to welcome Bob Davis and Tom Carroll of the local Home Waters 586 chapter of Trout Unlimited. Trout Unlimited is a national nonprofit organization with over 150,000 members and 400 chapters across the country, so very large. Um, its mission is to conserve, protect, and restore North America's cold water fisheries and their watersheds. And Bob and Tom will speak tonight about the organization and their chapters work specifically in Rensselaer County. Thanks, Sophia. I'll start. Uh, I'm Tom Carroll. Um, I'm, the, I'm the conservation committee chair for the Home Waters chapter uh, in Rensselaer County. I'm also the, uh, on the conservation committee for the New York State Council of Trout Unlimited. So um, you know, keeps me busy and keeps me in touch with a lot of the, um, you know, the, the cold water fishery conservation in the state of New York. Go ahead, Bob, if you want to introduce yourself. Well, I'm, uh, I'm Bob Davis. I've been the uh, president on and off for, for Home Waters, uh, along with a, a gentleman named Frank Catone over the years. Uh, Home Waters was uh, founded in seven, uh, 1980 or 78 or 79 by uh, Ralph Work and George Hemming. They kind of broke free from the Clearwater program because I think they were interested in protecting the waters of Rensselaer County. And uh, we are fortunate we have it. We have a senior member, uh, Bill Shorter, who is 98 years old. He lives in downtown Petersburg. Uh, he was in the 101st Airborne, and Bill was a intricate part of this program, and still is. And uh, so Tom is my right hand man. Uh, I was. We have floundered for years. Uh, we have some new people. Tom's one of them. And uh, we are uh, on a resurrection of sorts. And Tom, I picked, I asked him to be my conservation chairman and it was the smartest thing I ever did. So I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to uh, Tom and he's got lots to talk about. And uh, if we have any questions later, we'll try to help you out. Thanks, Bob. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. So as we mentioned, Home Waters Chapter Trout Unlimited, Rensselaer County. Um, that's our uh, that's our logo. Uh, how come we're not changing slides? Okay, here we go. Um, so as Sophie mentioned, you know th this is the mission for for you know the national, the state, and the and the local chapters to you know ar around. Uh, cold water resources, uh, you know, primarily dedicated to salmonid fishes. Salmonid fishes meaning trout, salmon, char, uh, all variety of fish that fall into that category. So, you know, to protect what we know we have, uh, we, there's a lot of nice trout waters in Rensselaer County in New York State. We're, we're blessed with, uh, with some beautiful places to fish and some really nice aquatic resources. Um, you know, we know that that the streams and, and the rivers that we want to protect are, are just part of a larger landscape you know, of habitats, including forests. So very proud to work with the, with the Rensselaer um, Plateau Alliance you know, on, on many things here. And I, you know, I'll, I'll, as I go, I'll try to remember to weave in how, we, how, you know, how the, the, the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance and Trout Unlimited have continued to cross paths over time. But we, you know, we protect what we have that's that's working. Um, reconnection is is a big piece of what Trout Unlimited likes to do, and I'll show you some examples later on about how how habitats, cold water habitats, get fragmented, um, and it, it's it's a devastating thing 
for the fish populations when 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 streams get broken into uh, impassable pieces. Um, restore. I'll show you some places that we we're looking to restore in Rensselaer County. Um, these are places that have had uh, that you know are, are undergoing significant stress, usually from erosion, um, and, and so those restoration efforts are a big part of what we do. And sustain is to look into the future, and I'll show you some some um, some forward looking stuff that that that. T, that Trout Unlimited is looking to do. So what did I hit before to get this to work? Oh, the mouse. Okay. Um, thank you, Sophie, you mentioned some of this. Uh, it's in Trout Unlimited, that we call it TU National, a nationwide volunteer organization, 42 councils. A council is you know, not quite equivalent to a state. Some, some states double up. Uh, there are some, you know, Canadian and international chapters, uh, sorry, councils. Uh, there's about 400 chapters and it varies a little bit between 150,000 and 200,000 members, depends on, depends on when you ask. Uh, Trout Unlimited is, you know, they have um, national uh, level lobbyists, uh, you know, they work, um, they, they do enormous projects, especially out west, uh, Snake River, um, dam removals are, are, are a big item for Trout Unlimited right now. So these, these are really, you know, top level conservation projects. So Trout Unlimited is a, is a big dynamic organization. New York State Council is, uh, is really 24 chapters. It, you know, uh, multi, there, it doesn't correspond to, to counties or anything. The chapters are kind of unique. They're based on zip codes. Um, you know, the, the, the council provides to the, to the local chapters technical support. That's, you'll see some of the maps I'll show you are, are you know, came from there. That, that's the technical support. Administrative service, they help with, you know, a, a, a not-for-profit group and, and, you know, tax exemptions and things like that. They help us get through that. They raise funds and they provide project funding to the chapters to do our work. Um, the homeowners chapter is, you know, we, you know, refer to it as Rensselaer County chapter sometimes. Um, it's, it's a little bit bigger than Rensselaer County. It includes the Hoosick watershed, which brings us up a little bit into Washington County and much of the Kinderhook watershed, except the very lower end. So it brings us you know, a bit down into Columbia County also um, and bounded by the Hudson and then bounded by the, the Massachusetts and Connecticut and Vermont state lines. So it's a pretty big area. Um, our chapter has uh, uh, give or take 90 members uh, I mentioned cold water conservation and in our in our um, in our in our work to you know to look at that as as part of a bigger picture. I'm going to get back. To, well, I'll have Bob get back to trout in the classroom in a minute. We also do something. Uh, you know, this is usually every November. Um, we we get some people together and we go out and we choose a stream and we look for reds. Reds are are um are are fish nests for lack of a better term. They're places where, um, where trout spawn and, and they're visible in the gravel beds where the fish spawn. And we, uh, we go out and we count them and geocode them and keep track of this data for future use and, and for protection of certain streams. We've, we've got a lot of good data on the, on the Black River, you know, up in Cherry Plains. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, trout stream that with, you know, with a pretty large breeding population. I'll show you some of that later on, some of the maps. Uh, we, we like to do riparian plantings, riparian meaning streamside, uh, places where, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, streams are, um, vulnerable to erosion or places where there just is no, uh, tree cover along a stream. Uh, you know, cold water is, like I mentioned, a big part of our mission and shade, um, you know, helps to keep that water cool. Uh, so does groundwater, you know, between groundwater and, and tree cover, that's, you know, what helps keep our water cool. So we just did in conjunction with the Rensselaer Land Trust, uh, a pretty large tree planting along the Hoosick at the canoe launch up in Eagle Bridge, 500 trees in, in a morning. Uh, we had, I think we had about what, 35 volunteers. And yeah, quite a few. And, yeah, and so quite a successful tree planting. Some of the trees were, you know, eight, 10 feet tall. Some of them were, were, were just, you know, in pots. Some of them were, were bare root, you know, seedlings. So a variety of species, and we had a, a nice little planting plant to try and you know, uh, put the right plants in the right places to, to help protect the stream bank. Um, macroinvertebrate surveys. 
uh, macroinvertebrates really, I mean, you, you could you know, break that down into aquatic insects. Uh, there's others, there's snails, there's beetles, there's, there's a lot of things that fit in the category of macroinvertebrates, but uh, this is part of a program that we do for, along, for and with DEC uh, called the wave sampling. Um, we, we, uh, we take a, a standardized sample of insects uh, from a stream, <coughs> excuse me, and, um, you know, and we, send the, we, we, we send the data into DEC and they use that information to help clarify uh, or, or to determine the condition of the stream. Certain insects do better in certain water conditions. So by looking at the types and numbers of insects that they see, they have, it gives you some sense, sort of a gross indicator of the health of the stream. So we send that data in, it helps them decide which streams to do a larger okay. sampling okay. on. Okay, now we can hear you. Okay, oh, okay. We, Sorry. We, uh, the last probably three minutes, we couldn't hear you. Oh, something. What was, the what was the last thing I was talking, red surveys or? Red yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I could hear you okay, Bob, so it might have just- Yeah, been I could hear you. Uh, I could maybe it was just me then. Okay. Maybe it was my computer. Okay, very okay. good. So, you know, people always see Trout Unlimited kind of as a fishing club. And I, I, I you know, that I'd like to change that. Not that we don't like to go fishing, but that's not true at all. We all like to go fishing and we like to bring people fishing and we like to show people wonderful places and, you know, and show them, you know, uh, different types of fishing and, 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 you know, fishing in a pond, fishing in a stream, fishing for bass, fishing for trout. Uh, all that stuff is, is great to us. So, um, but that's not just what we do. We like to keep, you know, conservation in our, in, in our portfolio here. Uh, so Bob, can you give us a couple a minute or two on, on Trout in the Classroom? Sure, sure. That's, uh, so Trout in the Classroom, uh, we like to call it our tick program. And when I say that, a lot of people think I'm talking about deer ticks and, and they get a little bit squeamish about that, but, uh, over the years, uh, probably the last 10 or 15 years, we've had a number of schools in the uh, county that have participated in our uh, Trout in the Classroom. And uh, currently, uh, we have five different schools in the county, school systems. We have Averill Park, Berlin, Hoosick Falls, Maple Hill, Lansingburg, and uh, we have Grafton Lake State Park. Uh, we have the Trout in the Classroom. So essentially what that is, is uh, we have a, uh, a setup that uh, has a, uh, it's, it's a 50 gallon uh, fish tank with the uh, appropriate uh, filter system and then a $700 chiller. Because these fish, uh, we, we get eggs from uh, DEC, they call them eye eggs, they're just about ready to pop. Uh, we go down to, um, Hyde Park, they have a program down there. We, uh, the teachers sit through and, and the teachers are involved. We have teachers involved with this and we're very fortunate. This past year, who's at Falls, uh, the teacher had a baby, so she was out and Maple Hill uh, didn't participate, but uh, we had Lansingburg, Berlin and Averill Park. And uh, so they go down, they go down for the day they sit through all this, uh, the uh, talks about how to take care of it. It's very popular downstate, all the way to the city. There's a lot of uh, Staten Island, New York, Westchester County. It's, it's very, we're, we're on the Northern fringe of this. And uh, we pick up the eggs and then uh, the kids and the teachers uh, run the program. So what, I have a, a retired teacher from, Aver, uh, from Berlin, Audrey Vanderhoff, She's my uh, assistant, my liaison, my right-hand woman for this because I'm a retired fireman. I have no idea about school. And Audrey is one of my best friends and she helps us out with this immeasurably. And uh, she, she coordinates with DEC, with down at Hyde Park and all, gets the teachers together and gets everybody on the same page. And, and, and that works out really good. Uh, the RCCA, the Rensselaer County Conservation Alliance, and the Castleton Fish and Game Club uh, have uh, uh, purchased equipment to help us out. Uh, the average uh, price of said equipment is about a thousand bucks. And the, the most expensive part of that is the chiller, which is about $700. And uh, so what, 
what happens is we, uh, they raise the fish from October to May. Uh, then they release the fish in different locations around the county. Uh, Berlin puts them in the, uh, the Little Hoosick right across the street from the school. Uh, Averill Park puts them in uh, one of the watersheds uh, by Tom's house. I, I think it's the wine at Skill. Uh, Lansky Berg did the same thing. So the, the, the fish, uh, Grafton puts them in the ponds up there at, uh, at Grafton Lakes. And uh, the value of the thing is education. Okay, that's, that's what it's all about. It's uh, an interesting way for the kids to be involved. They learn environmental education. They learn about the water. They learn about fish. They learn, learn about stream health. Uh, they're probably, I, I don't know how far the teachers go. Now we have this PFOA stuff going on in the area. You know, so they're, they're learning a, a variety of things. The, the program is that they, the teachers, as far as I know, they'll uh, appoint kids. So it's almost like a hierarchy where certain students will be in charge and then they have the underlings uh, a system. So they learn how to deal with people, you know, how to be, how to be a manager, how to take care of the fish, what to do, what's right, what's wrong, water quality, the whole nine yards. And uh, it's, it's a, a they assist the other kids in running the program. They oversee the program. And then the teacher oversees the whole thing. And, and it works out pretty good. Oh, we, they lose some fish. Sometimes they lose all the fish. But that's just part of the program. And then next year, they'll sign up again. And, and, uh, and that's the way it works. They, uh, and the interesting thing is we have some of the kids get really interested in the environmental uh, occupations. You know, we had a couple of the kids from Berlin. Uh, they wanted to be uh, look into DEC jobs. Uh, we had one kid's going to be from Averill Park's going to be a fisheries tech at Cobleskill. He's going to school for that. Uh, some of them want to be forest rangers, DEC officers, police officers, or just science or, or being a science teacher. All these really interesting things. So we're, it, it, it works out really cool. And uh, it's an ongoing thing. Uh, COVID kind of kicked us back a little bit. And, um, but, you know, come September, Audrey will get a hold of all the teachers and, and see who's interested in participating again uh, when school starts. And, and then we start the process all over again. So that's a, that's a trout in the classroom. So this is a Bigfoot sighting. Oops, I mean, that's Bob. <laughs> um, a Yeti. Red Star County Bigfoot sighting. This is this is one of our wave samplings. You can see by Bob's feet there that it's it's a it's a kick net, and what um, you know it's a big square net. And uh, and uh, uh, um, Brian and Zach there are stirring up the bottom and, and trying to uh, you know uh, stir up some aquatic insects, and we catch them in the net. We categorize them, count them, and send the data to the DEC. This is one of our wave samplings. So this is the sort of bug that we might see. This is a Helgramite. Um, it's it's an interesting insect. It's it's actually uh, it's a predatory insect. It eats other aquatic insects. You can see the mandibles on it. Uh, that's it's designed to eat other bugs. It's it's an insect. You can see it's got six legs and a and a thorax and a body there. Just if you can just sort of visualize that head in the in the in the thorax there. This part, I'll show you what the adult looks like. The the these these legs here are from locomotion when it's a a larva like this, and the and the and the very small hairs are setae. That, that's for gas exchange. That's how how this breeds. This this is a um a pretty good sized insect. And you know the, while you know they they usually don't unless you really harass them. They've been known to bite. People collect them for bait too because they're they're so big and feisty. Um, but that's a helgramite. That's they they generally ref reflect pretty good water quality. You know they they don't live in places where the Water is too warm or too slow, but they need lots, lots of oxygen. That's what the that's what the insect looks like. That's a Dobson fly. Note the head and the neck. No, sorry, the head and, and the thorax. Uh, this is a female. You can see the that the the mandibles are smaller. The males, the mandibles are much much longer. Um, the the males, those mandibles are pretty useless. Um, the females, if you harass them enough, they still they they might give you a bite. Uh, they don't at this stage of their life. They don't eat. Uh, they sometimes they're known to drink like some some flower nectar and things like that, but they generally are they're, they're, this this phase of their life cycle they real they're just reproductive. 
Uh, their whole mission is to make more Dobson flies and more Elgamites. But you see, that's a pretty good size insect. They're not all that big. That's just a kind of a spectacular one. If you were a Helgramite, this is probably what you'd be eating. These are, um, these are mayflies, uh, mayfly larva. Um, they, I think they're the same species there. I didn't get, I didn't take the time to speciate them. Um, you know, the, you, these are filter feeders. You can see on their forelegs here, these fibery things are for catching food. They eat, um, you know, pretty much flotsam and jetsam, carbon-based food, uh, bits of plant matter, leaves, uh, anything that has carbon or protein in it, they, you know, they would gather it up and eat it. The, the, these fibers on their tail are for the same purpose. They, they basically filter particles out of the water. Uh, these discs or, or fins that you see on the side here, the, this is their version of CETA for breathing. That's how they, that's how they gas exchange. Um, you know, they're, um, they usually are, live one year. The, you know, eggs are laid, you know, maybe this time of year, they overwinter, and then next year they, they hatch out as an adult. Um, those are just two different ages. They're two different sizes. They might be two different species. Um, but so mayflies are, are, are a, also an indicator of good water quality. Um, I didn't bring a lot of bug pictures because I have a lot of slides and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on entomology. But I think that Red Sur Plateau Alliance just maybe a week or two ago with, with Pam Jacobson, I think she's on the call, did a, did a whole uh, you know, uh, macro invertebrate session up at the Barberville Falls. So if you were part of that, you probably learned much more about bugs than you're going to learn tonight. Um, anyway, here's an adult mayfly. I don't think they're the same species, but that's a, it's a, just a beautiful picture of an adult mayfly. Um, this is uh, the thing that, that a lot of trout fishermen really sort of fixate on are these mayflies. You know, you hear about matching the hatches and people tying their own flies. They, they're trying to make flies that look like this. This, this, is, a, this, is, a, this is a delicious meal for a trout. Um, this also is, you know, the reproductive version of the, of those other, of the, of the, of the larva. You know, these are the larva, they, they overwinter. This guy only live a few days long enough to, to, to lay eggs to mate, lay eggs and die. Uh, trout will eat them as they emerge from the water, uh, as they lay their eggs. And after they spin and fall into the water again, they're, they're vulnerable to being eaten by trout. Um, you know, the, the family of insects are called the ephemera, as in the word ephemeral, meaning that they only last a very short time. You know, they, the, this, psych, this stage of the insect's life is short and sweet, but they're beautiful things. This is this is a bunch of us. This is our you know this this is about our tree planting uh, along the Hoosick River. The Hoosick's a pretty big river, and right you can see how this you know the, this this grassy um, environment continued for a third of a mile along the stream. So we 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 put in 500 trees to get a, a thick buffer like you see on the other side. The tree roots do a wonderful job of holding the soil in place, shading the water, uh, just you know making better habitat, adding leaves to the water for insects to eat. You know, without without you know uh, the riparian buffer on the stream, it, it, things go bad. You know, pretty quick and within a few years. So anyway, that's just a bunch of us um, posing. Hmm. Um, this is not a very good picture, but this is a fish nest. This is this is this is probably a a, a, a pretty small brook trout. Red. Um, you can see the darker areas here are gravel. But it, you know, it gets algae on it. It doesn't. You know, it's 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 sort of all the gravel is generally a darker color because of you know plant life and things on it. When when the trout spawn, uh, the female will come and, and just with her body uh, move the gravel around to create a depression in the gravel. Uh, when she's ready, she'll lay her eggs, and usually there's a, a crowd of males around her to help you know to fertilize the eggs. So she scatters the eggs into the into the into the into the gravel depression that she created, and the males fertilize the eggs. Um, I'm going to tell you another story later on, and, and that, that whole process is going to be a little bit important to that story. So, uh, and then the female will, will then take her body again and her tail and, and try to bury the eggs the best she can. Uh, it helps to mix the water, to mix the gametes, and she'll leave uh, maybe a slightly raised area in, in the stream bed with the eggs in the gravel spaces. And the, they might guard it, you know, for some number of hours or a day or two, but then they leave them, um, you know, Brook trout and brown trout spawn in the autumn, so we typically look for these in, in, in early November. 
Um, and the eggs will overwinter in the red or sometimes they move, move a little bit. Uh, once they hatch out, the, the, you know, the fry, the alevin um, will live in the spaces in the gravel until they get a little bigger. Then they come, they stick their heads up and take their chances in the stream. And, you know, they, they and, and, you know, somewhere between one and 5% of the eggs survive to adulthood. It's, it may not be the most efficient system, but it's been around a long time and it works. So just some more projects that we're doing right now. Th these are, um, the, we're working on a restoration project on the post and kill and pro we're hoping construction will be um, next summer. Uh, I'll show you a picture. The, the post and kill, it's a stream bank restoration uh, during Lee and Irene uh, behind the firehouse in, in the village of post and kill flooded very badly and it probably was unwise, but uh, folks got in the stream with a bulldozer to, to ease the, the, uh, the flooding. Um, they cleaned out all the habitat, all the rocks, everything deep in the stream and they, they channelized it. They, they piled up the gravel on both sides of the stream and made it a deep channel. Um, it creates huge flooding problems and big erosion problems because instead of um, you know, the water going slowly and spreading out into the floodplain, uh, the water goes through at a much higher speed, giving it much more energy so it can do much more damage. Uh, this erosion is a big problem for us because all the material that moves fills in other parts of the stream downstream. So all the fine sediments fill in the pools, fill in the gravel spaces. Uh, it, pretty, it, it, can, it, it does a, a, a lot of damage to, to, the, to the aquatic habitat when you put a lot of uh, loose soil into a stream on a short-term basis. Every stream moves moves material, moves sediment, but too much is, is, is a terrible thing. Uh, the other thing we got, we're doing is temperature monitor, monitoring. We have uh, 11, we have 12 temperature monitors out right now. I'll show you a picture of one of, of two different kinds. Um, we have them in the Post and Kill, the Kinderhook, the Black River, the Mordner Kill, and the Quacken Kill. On the Quacken Kill, an interesting one is we're, we're, we're getting data up there because we want to do a, uh, what they call an egg stocking. The upper Quackenkill has no trout in it, but it seems like it's a good environment for them. So instead of stocking fish, we're going to just like the trout, just like the the, the trout in the classroom project, we're going to try stocking eggs into the stream. Uh, brown trout eggs in, in a in a, uh, in a in a small plastic box that simulates spaces in the gravel, um, and you know put in a few thousand eggs and see if we can uh, you know grow some brown trout in, in the upper Quackenkill above the, above the Dunham Reservoir. So we've been getting temperature data up there for you know, better than a year and we're still doing that to, to, just to see if we can find the, the, really the best spot to do that. This is one of our temperature monitors. This one is a, it's a, it's a type called a mayfly. Um, it's solar powered, as you can see. It's got, it's got a, um, um, a modem in it. So, and the, the sensor is in the water. Um, so it, it records three different things. It, it takes the water depth, it takes the temperature, and it takes the uh, electrical conductivity every 15 minutes. Uh, electrical conductivity really is a, a, a proxy for dissolved solids in the stream. You know, uh, see how much minerals are in the water. Rainwater has almost no minerals. Water that's been, you know, say flowing over limestone would have a lot of minerals. Uh, you know, the, the post and kill is really a, a sort of a peat stream. It's it, the water's kind of brown. It gets a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, organic matter from, you know, from the soils. It's, it's not a very mineral rich stream, but it's, um, you know, we, we still get the data and we still, uh, you know, if you want to see the data, I was going to show it tonight, but it's a little complex and I think we're running a little over time here. Um, if you go to our website, there's a link to it and you can see the data. Like I say, every 15 minutes it updates. If you have a hankering to see what the temperature and the depth of the post and kill is right now behind the post and kill firehouse, you can go to our website and, and the web, the, the, uh, our, our Mayfly will tell you. This is another version of our, one of our temperature monitors. It's called the Tidbit. Um, the, 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 you know, the uh, PVC pipe is really just to protect it. You can see these, uh, these holes here that line up. We take a piece of rebar and drive it into the stream bed and it holds it in place. We leave, we, leave these, we leave this in for most of the year. And uh, it, this is a temperature logger. It takes a, temp, it takes a temperature every 15 minutes and stores it. And then we can go back and, you know, periodically and we, um, you take it out of the water and you can, it Bluetooths to your phone and you, you pick up the data with your phone and then you can 
email it to yourself so we you know you can pick up the data and uh and transfer it to your computer before you even get home um you know, back in the paleozoic era when i got my biology degree um you know we didn't have these kinds of things so it, this is this is a, sort of a lot of fun for us we have 11 of these things out in, in like i say in, in five streams so um we just finished putting them all out it's a it's a, it's a busy time this is the project site that I mentioned on the post and kill. So just, just for scale, it's a little, bit of a, a little bit of a blow up here between the water depth, which is less than knee deep, um, and, and the edge of the bank here, um, it's, you're looking at about four feet. Uh, this, according to the firehouse folks, there's this, this stream bank probably has come back six feet since Lee and Irene. So six feet times four feet times 400 feet is a lot of soil. Uh, you can see the soil here is very, very, it's very, it's really good farmland soil. It's loamy. It's it's clay and sand and gravel mix. It's you know it, this is old cornfield, uh, and there's there's active cornfield on the other side. So this this material is very fine. It goes downstream pretty far, and it it, it really clogs up our you know the the the, the spawning areas and the and the and the growing areas for the trout. The the plan here would be to 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 rebuild this this bank. With trees, with with down trees, uh, trees with roots on them, and some and some large rocks. Uh, it, it's 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 you know it's it's surveyed out and it's engineered to withstand you know even a very large flood, and allow the stream to um to to get back to its floodplain. So as I mentioned before, if if the stream if you know this so this the, the water at this point in this picture isn't isn't very fast or very strong, uh, and it's probably moving very little material but one flood if that if that water goes up two feet it's gonna it moves material every time and lots of it so during during the high water events is when all the erosion happens and it, it can you know in, in last summer when we had that big uh, the, the big floods in april park two more feet disappeared in one day so it's um you know uh, this is our project for next summer we hope to have the funding in place and the materials in place by next summer this is uh, we're, we're doing two pieces on the on the on the post and kill. This is about two thousand feet farther downstream. This is the conjunction of the um, the quack and kill and the post and kill. Um, this is a great little trout fishing hole. Uh, it gets stocked every year by the DEC with uh, usually several hundred fish, and they spread out up and down the stream. Once the water warms up a little bit, it becomes a pretty popular swimming hole. And the, the water here is a little bit higher, but you can see right here there's a lot of rocks underwater. And every year, the, the swimmers um, take it upon themselves to rearrange those rocks to make the pool deeper, to make the swimming better. And what they've managed to do is, is erode this bank tremendously. This has gone back and in the last five years, this has moved back a couple feet. You can see all the heavy wear and tear here just from, from foot traffic. Um, so this pool takes a tremendous beating uh, from, you know, from, from, uh, um, from people you know, using it as a swimming hole. Um, they are trespassing, um, but it, it seems like it, you know it, it's it's pretty popular, and, and no one really um, you know um, puts it to the test there. So our plan is to put in some much bigger rocks here that let's just say people with beer muscles can't move, um, so that we will stabilize the pool. Uh, it'll, it'll have the same effect. It'll deepen the pool a little bit. It'll make a little waterfall there. It'll probably it'll probably dig another deeper pool down here, but it, it'll be something that's not going to move and not going to be um, disturbed so much by the swimmers. All right, so this is a brook trout. This is this is a, one of our indicator species. This we spend a lot of time talking about brook trout and trout unlimited because they're while they're very resilient in certain habitats, they're also very fragile in others. Uh, this, as you can see, is a pretty small fish. It's about six inches maybe, um, and you know this is about the size when they do the trout when they do the trout in the classroom they use brown trout mostly this is about the size they are when they release them you can see these dark spots here are called par marks when the fish is younger they're much more obvious and they're much you know uh, much longer so this fish I'm going to guess is about two years old and, and may spawn this year or the year after even at six inches long this fish brook trout will spawn when they're very small like this um, so they're insect eaters when they're this size. Uh, you know, they, they generally are confined to very small streams, uh, not because they don't get big or they can't get big. You know, brook, a brook trout can get to be two feet and, you know, in 10 pounds. Um, 
it's just that they don't compete well with other fish like smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, even brown trout. Um, so they they wind up uh, sort of stuck in the marginal areas where where the water is cold and clear and kind of thin, meaning shallow. Uh, and they do well there where other fish don't. So our New York State fish here is under a lot of pressure uh, because of you know pressure from other fish and warm waters. Uh, you know, other species being in the larger streams. Uh, this fish, all, all the fish I'm gonna show you are from Rensselaer County. This one is from uh, um, uh, Cherry Plain State Park. This is a brown trout in the, from, from the Kinderhook. Um, brown trout, uh, well, let me just go back one second. You know, you, one thing about brook trout, you can really identify them. You see the white edges on their fins there are very prominent. Uh, usually red spots with blue circles around them. Uh, when they're in breeding color, the belly will be bright orange. They have oh, what they call vermiculations here. The spots are mo look more like, uh, like, worm, like worm patterns. You can see it on the fin a little bit. So they're pretty easy to identify. They're, they're, they're probably our prettiest trout. Um, a little bit slower growing than a brown. That's a brown. Uh, the spots you can see are very uniform. There's some red ones. They're usually circled in white. Um, a white belly unless they're in breeding conditions when they have a yellow one, very faint white edges, usually not very prominent. Uh, a forked tail, the, the brook trout has more of a square tail. Um, this, these fish get bigger faster and can tolerate warmer water. Brook trout, if the water gets over 72 degrees or so for more than a few days, uh, it will, is probably fatal. Um, now, not every stream is homogenous. There, there's cold spots and warm spots. And what will happen is the fish will seek out the smaller, colder places. Uh, and for brook trout, sometimes that means they wind up stuck in a very small place where one, one brown trout can, can clean out a lot of them. So the, the, the brown trout can, you know, somewhere around 76 degrees is more like their upper, upper range. So it's a big difference. Um, looking at this fish, I can almost, I almost assure you that that's a stocked brown trout. Uh, the fins are a little bit stubby. The colors aren't that aren't that bright. Um, it's the, the the height of the fish isn't. It's it's kind of long and lean instead of really tall here. Really chubby. Um, interesting thing about these fish, they're called the Rome strain. DEC raises hundreds of thousands of pounds of fish every year and, and releases them into waters in New York and all over the state. Um, the Rome strain is a fish that they found in the 1940s near Rome, New York. That was uh, that had a natural immunity to a disease called furunculosis. Say that twice. Um, furunculosis is a is a scourge of hatcheries. It, it, if, if it shows up in the hatchery, it'll kill most of the fish, and the 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 the, the hatchery masters will will the hatchery workers will, will destroy all the rest so they don't introduce it into wild waters. This this strain of fish is 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 naturally immune. And they've been breeding it for that natural immunity for many, many, many generations. They've actually transferred the genetics of this fish all over the world. Um, brown trout are not native to, to the United States or even the Western Hemisphere. Most of them are descendants of fish from Scotland, but they're, they're native to all over Europe, um, Northern Europe. Um, so recently they decided that this strain of fish is not performing very well, either in the hatchery or in the wild. So they've, they've gotten some fish from the Oriskany Creek, also in central New York, near, also near Rome, New York. Uh, and they're breeding in those, those wild Oriskany fish. Uh, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're crossing the, the wild males with the, with the hatchery females, exposing the fish to furunculosis. The ones that survive are then used as their breeding stock for the next generation. I think they're on to generation four or five now. And they, this is the first year they've released the, what they call their half wild strain. Uh, they prefer, they're reported to perform much better in a wild system and do much better in the hatchery. So th there's, there's a real science to, you know, to, to raising these fish. Uh, this, this is a good lesson, I think, for the, for the trout in the classroom kids and how these genetics play an important role in, in, in survival of trout. This is a rainbow trout. From, uh, this is from the Little Hoosick. Um, also not native to, to the Eastern United States, it's native to California. Uh, these fish were brought, both the brown and the rainbow were brought here in the late 1800s when it was thought that, you know, this was a good way, diversifying the, the different trout species was a good idea. Um, you can see the, the spot, they really don't have spots, they more have speckles, a square tail, big powerful body. Um, well, just, well, 
So all these fish, when they're small, are, are insect eaters. And when they get to a certain size, they become Piscivorians. They, they eat other fish. This is a good size rainbow. You can see this is a wild fish. Look at the, the body depth here is really good. The fins are really like pristine. Um, this, this, is a, this is a nice rainbow. People like catching rainbows because they're so strong. They jump, they fight like crazy. They don't give up. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're an anglers. Uh, anglers really like these fish. Uh, and they're now, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're wild spawning in, in, in the Hoosick River, the Little Hoosick River and, and some of the tributaries too. So, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're, 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 they've been naturalized in Rensselaer County along with the brown trout. That's not a trout. Um, that's a largemouth bass. That's from the Adirondacks. Um, the, these fish are all, you can see how this fish is really designed or evolved, better word, to eat fish. The size of his mouth is colossal compared to what a trout is. That's about a three pound fish. If anybody ever wants to go fly fishing for bass on a fly rod, that's how I, that's how I started fly fishing. It's, it's this, this is a great angling experience catching a fish like this on a fly rod. But the, these fish um, can tolerate much, much warmer water 80, 82 degrees, no problem. So they, in, in some places, they wind up taking over the largest lakes, um, and some, and sometimes even big rivers become, you know, dominated by by um, these different types of sunfish, uh, largemouth and smallmouth bass. Sorry. So this is our this is our future look here. I'm going to show you some stuff about what they call prior what we call priority waters. Um, Trout Unlimited has taken the time to identify um, some of the places that have the greatest chance of conserving and protecting wild fish now and into the future. Um, so who knows what the future holds concerning climate and cold water? Um, you know, probably we need to prepare ourselves for, you know, reduced uh, ranges of, of, of cold water fish. But so we're, we're taking a look now, where are those places so that we can, um, you know, be prepared for you know, our, our, warming, our warming world. Um, so um, it's really geographically, uh, you know, based. Uh, and every, you know, from a TU perspective, this is a national um, event, a national uh, activity. I'm just gonna show you the New York piece of it because it's the part I'm familiar with. There's our state, the, um, the dark blue, um, now this, well, the, the data is, is actual fish data. Some of it is projections. Some of it is five or six or seven years old. Some of it is newer. So the, the data quality varies quite a bit, um, but it's the best data we have, so we're using it. The dark blue are strongholds. Strongholds are of wild fish. These are wild trout, fish that are naturally reproducing on their own, not, not stocked. Um, the stronghold is, is a place where there's about 2,500 breeding fish in what they call a huck eight watershed. It's a certain size watershed. Um, you, you know, you can see like that's about a, about a huck eight size. So there's, there's 2,500 breeding trout in, in a space about that size. Um, persistent means there's about 500. So these, these, are, these are good, you know, pers good quality populations of trout. Um, the Adirondacks, as you can see, is very, very strong in, in trout populations. Uh, the Eastern Adirondacks would probably be a little darker there too, except the data is not as good. But the Adirondacks is one of our, and I'll show you in a second where our priority waters is. It, 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 that's an important place for us. So is the Champlain Basin, the Tug Hill Plateau. The Allegheny Plateau has, has lots of cold water and breeding fish. The Catskills, famous, absolutely famous in the fly fishing world. It's where fly fishing in America first came to know each other. And here's our Taconic Range. So these are, these are TU's um, priority water areas. I mentioned them, Lake Champlain, Adirondacks, uh, the Salmon Sandy Complex up here, that's the Salmon River and the Sandy Creek, um, you know, up in the Tug Hill Plateau. The Salmon River is interesting because um, it, it's actually a Pacific salmon fishery. There's, there's a hatchery on the Salmon River uh, where uh, uh, Pacific salmon are introduced into the river as small fish. They, they, they work their way out into Lake Ontario and every, um, every year they return. Um, uh, it's a huge, absolutely huge salmon run every fall. Thousands of fishermen come in. It's a, it's a colossal industry for, you know, for Pulaski uh, and Altmar in that area. 
thousands of people come up to fish this this salmon run. They're Pacific salmon, so they they come upstream, they spawn, and they perish. Uh, Atlantic salmon don't. Our all our trout species I just showed you don't. They they live to spawn another day. Um, but the salmon here are stuck beneath the salmon uh, salmon reservoir. That there, there's a dam there, and they can't get past it. Uh, what we're talking about here for New York priorities is, is above that. There's a lot of wild speed, a lot of wild trout up above that, above the reservoir. It's a great river system. The upper Genesee River here, cold water comes in out of Pennsylvania and works its way all the way up into Rochester. Um, there's a, you'll see a couple of places that show up here as, as smaller priorities for us. The upper Susquehanna, the upper Delaware, both part of the Catskills water, you know, uh, water complexes there and the Taconic Range, much to my delight is one of our priority water areas. And I'll show you more about that later. Um, this is, um, these, these purple areas are areas that where DEC has, has decided these are their priorities and they, they, they worked with us and we worked with them to, to make sure that we, a lot of this stuff overlapped and that we were aware of what each other were doing. Region one, here's an interesting one. On Long Island, we have a population of brook trout. These brook trout, if, there, if, if uh, conservation efforts go well, we'll be able to once again reach the Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is a long-term project. Uh, they call them sea run trout, uh, brook trout, brown trout, and rainbow trout can all migrate to the ocean, feed for a while and go back. When, when rainbows do it, they call them steelhead. Um, so that's a, that's a long-term project. This is a very, very stressed complex down here, the Carmen's River. Um, region three, region two is New York City. They have no cold water, no trout streams to speak of. Um, region three, this is the Willowemock Creek, a very historical trout stream. Uh, a lot of people fish it, a lot of people love it and, and work to protect it. Uh, region four is to be determined, that's us. Region five is the Batten Kill. Um, the Batten Kill is another historic stream. Uh, trout Unlimited, trout, trout, TU National has what they call a home rule waters initiative going right now. They, they, they have uh, New York and Vermont, TU and DECs, the, the, the conservation agencies from both New York and Vermont uh, doing lots of restoration work on the Batten Kill right now, last year, this year, and next year. Uh, so they're, they're doing a lot of rehab work on the Batten Kill. Uh, now it's a, it's a famous and beloved trout stream. Um, region six up here, uh, the, head, the uh, headwaters of the, um, of the Black River, working the way over into the, onto the Tug Hill Plateau here. This is about reconnection and I'll show you some examples of, of culverts that cause problems and, and they're looking to, to solve some human made problems on the streams that, 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 uh, that, that split the habitat um, that you know uh, sometimes even ruined a trout stream. Um, region seven, that's the upper salmon. Region nine, it's a small stream out here uh, in Clear Creek. Uh, Region eight, this is the uh, upper Cahocton River. These are chapters, uh, TU chapters got to vote and say, where do, where do, where do they think uh, TU should prioritize? Um, so we have the Wiscoy Creek out west. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very um, prolific uh, trout breeding stream. Um, the Oatka Creek, this is actually the first hatchery in North and South America was on the Oaxaca Creek. Actually on the Spring Creek, it's a little feeder creek to the Oaxaca. This is where um, uh, trout stocking was invented. Um, the, uh, the Owego Creek, the Chittenango Creek, the Skinevis. Uh, we, we actually helped the, some of the folks in, in the chapter there this summer. We were, um, we were catching brook trout and clipping their fins and sending the, the fin sample in for DNA analysis as part of a, it, it's a, um, it's a, it's a project on the Susquehanna. They're trying to identify which, uh, you know, the genetics of these brook trout and, you know, how they're related to each other and which strains are which and how did these fish get here and how do we protect them? So they want to, by looking at the really, you know, the, uh, the, the, the very, you know, looking deep into the genetics of the brook trout, they can tell which fish are related to which and, um, and you know, and how they got to where they are and which ones were maybe stocked a long time ago. And which ones are, are, are actually fish that have been there since the glaciers were here. Um, the Saranac, and this one's interesting because Atlantic salmon um, inhabit the Lake Champlain and swim up the Saranac in pretty good runs every year. But, you know, there's a lot of hydroelectric action up there and there's dams that, 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 that interfere with that breeding process. But 
there's a lot of efforts to put in fish ladders and some and make access for the Atlantic salmon better. Um, I think I got them all there. So now I'm going to try to uh, uh, stop sharing and see if I can show you a little bit more about our Rensselaer Plateau. Let me see if I can do this. Um, bear with me for a second. Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. This is the base map of that data I showed you before. And here's our, here's our Rensselaer Plateau. The, this area right here, this, um, this uh, persistent area here, that's um, Cherry Plain State Park, the Black River, and the Roaring Brook. I went on a nice hike with some folks from the, from the Rensselaer Plateau the other day to see the, the, um, the Roaring Brook. It's, it's, a, it's a new parcel that you guys acquired. It's a beautiful little stream, and I got a really interesting story about it coming up. Um, uh, it's got both brown and brook trout in it. Uh, it it's, a, it's, a, it's a feeder stream to the Kinderhook, as is the black. Um, um, this is the headwaters of the Little Hoosick and the Cronk Brook. This is the Dill Creek, another RPA property. It's, it's conserved. And this is the, uh, the Hill Hollow um, Brook. I think the Rensselaer Land Trust just acquired that. So all these conservation projects are, are, are really exciting to me because you're really, you know, the, these, these big forest, par, forest parcels that you're picking up, uh, you know, are, are really coincide well with the cold water conservation and the cold water that we're trying to preserve. You can see if I, if I move out a little bit that the, all these patches all the way down the Taconics here, uh, th this is the batten kill up here, all these patches, there's a whole bunch of small ones and that's all about reconnection. If, if these, parcels could, you know, be connected or be connected closer, you can, you know, attach them to a neighboring watershed, you can increase their size or maybe, you know, start to get some of these fish, um, you know, um, connected back together, get larger populations and get those, you know, save those genetics. A lot of these places here are brook trout waters. You know, there's no, you know, this is brook trout and brown trout, this map, but, you know, some of these places, you know, these, these brook trout are really under tremendous ecological pressure. So I'm going to go go back now and, and uh, if I can to my slideshow. Uh, I guess here we are. I think that's it. No, this is it. Okay. This is a um, what we call a perched culvert. I mentioned before that the, about reconnecting streams. This is this is a virtually impassable barrier for fish. And, and other aquatic organisms, crayfish can't move up, you know, tadpoles can't move up, you know, this pretty much bisects the stream, uh, you know, sometimes there's more than one of these. And, and as I mentioned before, um, streams are not homogenous, um, you know, this could easily separate a, a population of fish from their spawning areas. Um, so the fish below could no longer access their spawning areas, the, the fish above wouldn't, would have a much smaller habitat and their population would shrink. Um, one culvert like this can, can literally wipe out a trout population on a stream, but usually what it does is it fragments them enough so that instead of having one robust population, you have two much weaker populations or maybe three or four weaker, depending on how many culverts you have. Um, culverts like this are, are very common. Um, you can see sort of the dynamics here. When, when, this, when you get a high flow event and this pipe really fills up, and the water comes out of there, it's gonna come out of there like a fire hose. And that's why there's a big hole here. If you see a culvert like this with a huge deep hole in front of it, it's, it's improperly designed and it's, 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 probably, um, it's probably impacting what we call uh, aquatic organism passage, AOP. Um, you, TU and Rens, you know, both Rensselaer County, um, the state and TU National, this is a priority for us to do to, is to identify and, and get rid of these culverts. It's not cheap. Um, you have to find them. You have to first. You have to identify them. Then you have to you know measure them. Um, then you have to design a new culvert, and then you have to find the money to change it out. Here's what a, a decent culvert looks like. Um, the big difference here, you'll see, it has a natural bottom, and it's nearly as wide as the stream is normally. Uh, a fish or any other organism going up here would hardly know that they're going through a culvert. Uh, typically, these, these are, you know, they're half tubes, they're set in cement. Um, the other benefit of these is they, they stand up to floods much better. 
uh, you know, if, if you get a high water flow, this can handle much more water than that perch culvert uh, without doing any damage to the roadway. The roadway would withstand a much higher flood. So, um, you know, they're, they're beneficial for, uh, for natural disaster, they're beneficial for, uh, for, for our fish populations. Um, you know, the, the, uh, it, it's quite, there, there, there's engineering firms that specialize in developing these. This is not the only way to do this. There's, there's concrete boxes, there's bridges, but you know, getting the, the width and the height and the, and the, you know, and the, and the elevation of the stream bed right is, is, you know, is an engineering, um, you know, uh, a job for engineers. All right, here's my interesting story. We're almost through. This is a trout. And you'll notice it looks a little bit different than all the other trout I showed you. This is called a tiger trout. Um, this was caught in the Roaring Brook. Uh, a tiger trout is a, a naturally occurring hybrid of a brown trout and a brook trout. That's a pretty fantastic thing because they're not the same genus. Um, trout, you know, well, brown trout are, are the genus Salmo. Uh, brook trout in the, are in the genus Salvinius. Uh, cross genus hybridization is relatively uh, uncommon. Um, the brook trout has 84 chromosomes. The, 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 uh, the brown trout has 80. This does not seem possible to a biologist that you would have you know, two different chromosome counts and still have a viable offspring. Well, uh, the, this fish has 82 chromosomes, um, looks completely different than the other trout, uh, behaves quite a bit different. It's much more, it grows much faster. It's a much more uh, aggressive fish eater. Um, the, they're sterile, they do not, they cannot reproduce. Although there's some people that think they might be able to under certain conditions, this fish can only happen if you have um, a, a female brook trout and a male brown trout that spawn near each other. They're not spawning with each other because they're, they're spawning on the same red or reds next to each other in the same general place and time. It's an accident. And even if the, even if the accident happens, only about one in a thousand of the eggs would, would mature to a fish. So this fish is a, bit of, a little bit of a, a, a rare little gem um, that was caught in, in a, the Roaring Brook that, that Rensselaer Plateau Alliance just acquired as a conservation property. So it's a pretty cool story. This is, this is um, you saw the Post and Kill Creek before where it was the sandy loam, sort of the bottom land. This is, this is a pretty typical stream for the, for the, for the Rensselaer Plateau. Uh, it's very rocky. You know, the soil has been eroded away from all the rocks. So what you have left is, a, is pretty much a rocky channel. Um, trout really like pools like this. This, you know, this, this water is a couple feet deep. It's well oxygenated. There's plenty of water coming in, nice and cold. Uh, this is actually um, the Post and Kill, not too far below the, the, the Barberville Falls. This is, this is a really beautiful look at a trout stream. I wish they all looked like this. But we have quite a few of these on, on the Rensselaer Plateau. And this is, this is our part of the, uh, you know, of, of the protect. And I just want to you know, thank the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance for all the, you know, the, the land protection that you're doing, because it's, you know, it certainly is, um, from our perspective, a really valuable thing to do. OK, I think that's it for me. Um, if anybody want, if we have some questions stacked up, uh, uh, I'm ready for you, Sophie. Well, thank you two so much. It was very interesting. There aren't currently any questions in the chat, but if anyone would like to come off mute and ask questions, feel free to do so. Oh, I must have answered all hi, questions. Just hi there, uh, Go ahead. Sophie and Tom and, and uh, Bob. It's Jim Bonesteel here. Um, I, I, great, great presentation. Um, let's see. I just wanted to, I wanted to correct one thing. The, uh, the Roaring Brook property, we helped uh, facilitate that, but that, that conservation was done by the, the conservation fund, and that property will be owned by DEC. So... Just wanted to make sure people listening didn't think we were take we didn't we didn't own it. Um, That's right. Thanks for reminding me. You did say that. I did. Yeah. So uh, no problem. And um, I also wanted to let you, Tom, know that the uh, the Valentino Family Community Forest Committee met a few nights ago. 
and they will be taking some trees down for parking, uh, a parking area there. And we, we talked about having the trees cut off at a height of 10 feet or something uh, and, and being able to pull the, the stumps out for you folks to use as your materials and your, your stream restoration. So we should connect on that uh, yeah. and make sure that we're giving you what you need if, or if, if you even want them that way. Yeah. So. So I, I think we, we had a nice conversation with, with Jeff Briggs the other night too at, 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 the, at, the, at the RLT concert about the same issue. Um, so I think, you know, we, we just have to get our timing right and, you know, and, and get our, our ducks in a row on that because we, you know, for, for that posting hill project, um, you know, we're looking for a fair amount of stone and we're looking for, you know, we need a, a fair number, about 40 or so uh, trees with roots on them. And they're actually hard to come by because you know, loggers don't like to handle trees that way. So uh, appreciate your thinking of us and, you know, and, and we'll, 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 we'll catch up with you on exactly how to process that and get those trees down. We, we actually, uh, I think we had some conversations with the, with the fire department folks about, you know, where we should stage those trees because- you Yeah, know, I, I, uh, I spoke to uh, Brian Teal the other night on the phone and he was bringing it up to the uh, powers that be to see if we can actually start staging some uh, material behind the firehouse. And so we're in, in that process. And we're also trying to figure out how to get said trees from point A to point B uh, with uh, probably trying to find a trucker that would be interested in hauling trees with root balls on them. And uh, it, we haven't found the guy yet, but we're 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 work, we're trying to find that. And uh, Tom and I went and looked at some cherry plain potatoes the other night uh, up at uh, up just below the park, and uh, they have some very large boulders that uh, we are interested in. I don't know if they're interested in in uh, giving them or selling them to us, but uh, we're in the process. I just want to also point out that there's our website up on the screen there. If you want to see, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, more about what we do, uh, and if you want to look into look at some of that, look at our Mayfly data. That's that's where you would go. Go home, homeorderstu.org, and um, you you can see more about Homewaters uh, Trout Unlimited. It looks like we have our first question in the chat. Um, are the smallmouth bass a threat to trout populations? So um, I think the short answer is yes, they can be. Um, so smallmouth bass, uh, you know, really like uh, a similar uh, habitat to, to, to many trout. Smallmouth bass do pretty well in, in, in rapid moving water like a small river. Um, <clears throat> they, they can tolerate much warmer water and, you know, and, you know, they're, they're, they're very aggressive fish eaters. So they're particularly harmful to, to the smaller trout and, and particularly to our, our brook trout populations. Um, so, you know, they, they can, you know, they can wreak havoc on a stream and, you know, in, in, in some instances, in some instances, there's, um, you know, um, you know, if, if a stream has, um, you know, um, smallmouth bass already in it, uh, you know, you, a lot of, you know, some, some uh, trout stocking organizations won't, you know, they, they kind of give up on the stream because once you get the smallmouth bass, um, you know, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're adding fish to the stream, you're really just feeding the bass. They're, they're so efficient at fish eating. So yeah, I, uh, now- I would think that they would be down in the lower post and kill, uh, yeah. down by the, the bends, uh, down, down by the city of Troy. Up on up on the plateau, I don't think they're yeah. that much. Thank you. They they don't do well in, in, in some of the side the smaller waters because they get big fast, and, and a big fish in a small stream is pretty much you know going to be eaten by something. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, critters out there that like fish. You have your mink, you have your herons. You know, you you know there's uh, there's mergansers. You know, everything goes after a fish, and you know uh, smallmouth bass. You know, need to have a certain amount of cover and a certain amount of depth to protect them, and so they'll, you know, they'll they'll stay out of the really small places.
Well, it doesn't seem like there are any more questions in the chat, so I'll open it up. Does anyone want to unmute with any questions? All right, well, I guess that's all. Thank you, Bob and Tom. You did an incredible job. I know I really enjoyed it. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you for the opportunity, folks. Yeah, and Tom, I wanna thank you because you really are the star of the program. I appreciate no, the, the work that you do is unbelievable. And uh, and you're part of the resurrection of Home Waters uh, 586. I thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to uh, let people know what we're doing. All right.